Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second 3P session of this week. And this is brought to you by a collaboration between the Van Andel Institute, Cure Parkinson's Trust, and the World Parkinson Coalition. My name is Lisa Berquist, and I'm a postdoc at the Van Andel Institute. And today, here with me, I have two excellent speaker as, speakers as usual. And we're going to kick off this section with Maria Elena Ticardi from Thomas Jefferson's University. She's a postdoc over there. And she will talk about the role of extracellular vesicles in a C9 ALS model. So I'm now going to hand it over to you, Maria. Okay. Uh, okay. Share. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for participating and thanks for listening to my talk. So, as Lisa said, the title of my talk is The Role of Extracellular Vesicle in a C9 ALS Model. As we all know, neurodegenerative diseases are a group of heterogeneous diseases that are all caused by the irreversible and progressive loss of a particular subset of neurons. ALS in particular is caused by the loss of uh, motor neurons that are the functional unit that connect the central nervous system with muscles. Indeed, when patients are diagnosed with ALS, they start losing muscle strength and control of voluntary movement. They also lose the speech and the swallowing. After a few years from the diagnosis, that comes from respiratory failure. The most common mutation present in both familiar and spolarity cases of ALS is a mutation present on the C9R72 gene. This mutation is a G4C2 repetition, which in normal individuals spans between 3 and 30 repetitions, while in affected individuals it can range up to uh, 3,000 repetitions. Even though the function of CNR72 gene is not uh, uh, well uh, described yet, there are three main mechanisms that are associated with, uh, the, um, with the presence of the mutation in, uh, on this gene. The first one is an upper insufficiency of the CNR72 protein, which is described as a loss of function while the other two are two gain of function uh, mechanism. The first one is the uh, formation uh, um, uh, linked to the presence of the RNA uh, with the G4C2 repetition of RNA foci inside the nucleus uh, recruiting uh, nuclear protein. This foci has also been identified in dendrites of neuronal cells. While uh, the third mechanism, that is the one that I'm most interested in, is the uh, aberrant translation of this uh, repetition. That is called uh, run translation. That means repeat uh, associated non-AUG translation. Uh, this, transla this aberrant translation is able to translate uh, um, the, the repetition without an ATG start code. And this means that can read both in the direct and and in the direct sense, the repetition in the three frames. So that pro and producing in the sense uh, reading of the of the repeats three uh, DPRs that are so called dipeptide proteins that are GA, GP, and GR. While in the anti sense, it produces uh, three other DPRs that are PR, PA, and PG. Poly-GP and poly-PG are usually uh, described and considered as the same protein. Between these proteins, the arginine-rich, that are the GR and the PR, are the ones that are found associated with neuronal toxicity. Also, in a recent uh, paper published from the lab that I'm working in right now, they demonstrated that these DPRs can be transmitted from cell to cell, and especially from neurons to neurons, and also from neurons to astrocytes. They came to the conclusion that these DPRs can be transmitted by three, in three ways. The first one is an anterograde transport, then an exosome independent transport, and an exosome dependent uh, transmission. Exosomes are part of what now is best known as extracellular vesicles. These extracellular vesicles are uh, double membrane organelles that are uh, um, heterogeneous for dimension, for biogenesis, and for content. Their principal role is to mediate cell-to-cell -cell communication. And also now it is, no, it is a belief that they also mediate organ-to-organ -organ communication since they can be found in the bloodstream. 
thanks to their property, of course, in the prostate barrier, in neurodegenerative disease, they have been proposed as therapeutics and biomarkers. So the question of my project is whether the DPRs that are spread through extracellular vesicles are actually able to cause toxicity in the recipient cells. First of all, we characterized the, our, uh, the population of extracellular vesicles that we were isolating. So uh, the protocol relies on a first centrifugation at 2000 G in which we get rid of the cell and of the apoptotic bodies and then of a two-step ultracentrifugation. The two-step ultracentrifugation uh, allow us to recollect a first population at P21 that are called larger EVs. And the second population that we are called P100 that is recollected after a centrifugation of 100 kg, that are the small, the small EVs. But the population has been characterized with non-track analysis that allow us to measure the dimension of these EVs. And as you can observe, uh, both the larger and the small EVs are between 100 nanometer and 200 nanometer, with the larger EVs being slightly bigger than the small EVs. Then, by Western blot, we characterize this population uh, looking for the presence of positive markers. And we see that both the P100 and P21 population were positive for a marker, well, very well-known marker of EVs as LAMP1, as LAMP1, TSG101, ELIX, and GAL3. Also, to assess the purity of our preparation, we look for negative marker of EVs like histone H3 and calnexin. And both the P21 and P100 population were found negative for these markers, meaning that our population are not contaminated by cellular contaminants. Uh, to understand which population of EVs were positive for the DPRs, we transfected NS634 with uh, this construct. In this construct, each DPR is uh, codon optimized and uh, its uh, translation is driven by ATG and they are all end tagged with GFP. So we transfect the NS634 with these five different DPRs, each one at a time, of course, and then we extract P21 and P100 pellet. By Western blot, we observed that both the P21 and P100 population were found positive for the, all the five different DPRs, as you can see here. The, anyway, um, Western blot does, doesn't allow us to understand if these DPRs are actually enclosed into the EVs. And to address this question, we use this approach based on the use of the cytoflake. Cytoflex is a, is a cytofluorimeter that uh, um, allows the use of violet light uh, for the site scattering. And this enhances sensibility for the detection of EVs. This is the gating strategy. And uh, first of all, we isolate, uh, um, we gated a population based on the forward and the site scattering. And then looking in this population, we, uh, we were able to gate for other population based on the colors of this population. Um, so what we did was to co-transfect NSC34 with CD63 tagged with GFP and with the DPRs that I presented before, but no more tagged with GFP, but tagged with MCR. And uh, analyzing with cytokine, we wanted to look if there was a population that was positive both for, C for the CD63 marker and the MCR DPRs. Analyzing the P21 population, this is the box that we have to look at that tells us uh, which is the population that are both positive for MCR and CD63. We observed that in all conditions tested, there was a population that was positive for both the marker, even though it was different in uh, uh, numbers uh, um, across the different DPRs. Also in the P100 population, we found that there was a population of EVs positive for both the marker. This uh, brings us to the conclusion that actually the PRs are enclosed in both the P21 and the P100 population, uh, CD63, CD63 positive. To understand whether the spreading of the, of the DPRs was actually causing any toxicity in the recipient cell, we use a transwell system in which NSC34 were plated on the transwell and the cortical neurons were, in the, were instead plated in the bottom of the well. Cortical neurons were transfected with tilitometo, which allow by live imaging the tracking of the cell over time and the, the assessment of their death day by day. What we observed was that only 
in presence only when a cortical neuron when put in contact with NSEs translated with GR, we were able to uh, observe a reduction in viability of the recipient cells. So to address if this reduction in viability was actually linked to the production of polyGR positive EVs, we blocked the EVs production by GW4869, which is a drug that inhibits the ST independent production of EVs. This drug is able to reduce the, or, uh, the production of both the P21 and the P100 pellet. Also, um, as you can see from also from the quantification, also by Western blot, we observed that it was able to reduce also the polygr positive EVs, the production of polygr positive EVs. Um, by, by replicating basically the experiment that, that I showed you before with the transwell, we observed that treating NSCs with GW was actually able to rescue the decrease in viability that we observe when we put NSCs transferred with the GR in contact with the cortical neurons, bringing to the conclusion, leading to the conclusion that uh, the toxicity that we observed when NSCs were put in contact with cortical neurons was actually uh, linked to the production of, uh, <clears throat> with the production of EVs. Uh, to understand which population of EVs was actually linked to the spreading of this toxicity, we transfected NSCs 34 with, the, with, the, with GR and we, op and we isolated the P21 and the P100 EVs. And then we directly treated the uh, cortical neuron transfected with the tomato and we follow their viability over time. What we observe is that when P21 uh, positive for GR was added to the cortical neuron media, we didn't observe a dramatic reduction in viability. While when we put in contact contact the cortical neurons with, with an analogous number of EVs, but of small EVs positive for, G, positive for GR, we were actually able to recollect the same amount of toxicity. This uh, leads to the conclusion that uh, the, the main effector of this toxicity are actually the small EVs positive for the GR. What we know by literature is that uh, DPR toxicity is also length dependent. In vitro system have uh, demonstrated that uh, increasing the length of the GR was associated with the decrease in cell viability. And in in vivo model, we, uh, there was, um, it was published that uh, longer expansion were associated with a worse phenotype in mice, as you can see in this graph. So what, I, what we did was to produce a plasmid that uh, would uh, encode for GR100 and uh, we transfected the NSCs, we collect the two pellets, and we observed that uh, GR100 was present both in the P21 and in the P100 uh, population, even though uh, it was like, uh, it was not as abundant as the other two. So to address this, uh, to better address the characterization, we uh, again imply the cytoflex transfecting uh, the m cherry tag DPRs with 63 GFP, and then we isolating the P21 and P100 EVs, we, um, we analyze them by cytoflex. Cytoflex analysis uh, indeed tell us that there is a, a the, 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 the percentage of vesicles that are positive for GR100 are, uh, are less than the one positive for the uh, GR, for them cherry and them cherry uh, GR50. But uh, measuring the uh, fluorescence of each vesicles, we didn't observe a difference in the fluorescence of, of each vesicles, meaning that the number is different, but the, but the copies of protein loaded in each vesicles was actually the same. So we replicate the paradigm that I already presented by Transwell, and we observed that also GR100 was able to cause the same reduction in viability. Also treating uh, cortical neurons with the P100 the positive for GR was able to cause a reduction in uh, viability of cortical neurons of recipient cells. And then we also wanted to use a human system that are these I3 neurons derived from iPSCs. And when I treated them with the P100 EVs, a positive for GR50 and GR100, we observed that GR100 was the one that was having the worse uh, effect uh, on the viability of these cells. To understand which uh, toxic mechanism was actually triggered by the reception of these uh, EVs, we studied one of the most uh, uh, known uh, um, 
event in ALS that is TDP43 pathology. TDP43 in ALS has been found mislocalized, aggregated, and hyperphosphorylated. Both the hyperphosphorylation, the aggregation, and the mislocalization of TDP43 has been tied to uh, neuronal uh, toxicity. Also in C9 cases, ALS has been found mislocalized and aggregated. And thus the question was whether um, the reception of the DPRs through EVs was actually able to cause TDP43 mislocalization into the recipient cells. So we, we treated our cortical neurons with the EVs, uh, the P21 and the P100 pellet, uh, positive for, the, for GFP, GR50, and GR100. And we observed that after 24 hours, the cells are actually positive for GFP, meaning that the EVs have been, received and been uh, incorporated. Uh, then we stained for TDP43, and uh, we measured the intensity of TDP43 in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. And we made the ratio to understand if there was a cytoplasmic mislocalization, so if the intensity in the cytoplasm was actually increased. And what we observed was that at 24 hours, there was no uh, change in, uh, in TDP43 mislocalization across the different condition tested. We, we know by, by now that TDP43 mislocalization is actually uh, triggered by stress in the cell. And that stress in the cell can be measured by uh, looking at the integrated stress response. Integrated stress response is a very complex pathway, which main, uh, whose main uh, downstream effector is ATF4. ATF4 is a um, nuclear transcription factor which uh, uh, increase the transcription factor of cytoprotective genes when cell, and, well, where, uh, when cell undergoes stress. So uh, what, what we did was to measure whether uh, the reception and the incorporation of EVs was able to cause uh, ATF for translocation into the nucleus. So we treated our cells with, uh, with, um, with AVs, positive for GFP, GR50, and GR100, and we measure ATF4. And uh, always at 24 hours, we didn't see any increase in ATF4 localization into the nucleus in any condition test. Coming to the conclusion that at 24 hours, the reception of EVs was not able to cause any increase in cell stress, and, any, uh, and does uh, any TDP43 mislocalization. Uh, so, concluding, uh, the poly-EGR loaded, loaded into the small EVs is able to cause toxicity into the recipient cell in a length-dependent fashion, and at 24 hours, the reception of EVs uh, was not able to cause an increase in cell stress measured by the ISR activation, and, uh, and thus it was not associated with TDP43 mislocalization. Before acknowledging the people that I'm working with, I want to show you two of the further steps that I want to pursue. So the first one comes from this observation. So um, there are a number of positive, of MAP2 negative cells that are actually incorporating a lot of uh, EVs when treated with EVs. This led me to, this, uh, led me to the uh, question whether uh, the EVs are also modulating the fate of these cells and not only of neurons, and which, are the, which is the contribution of these cells that are probably glial cells, either astrocytes or microglia, to, um, to the disease and, to, and, and in, uh, in neuronal toxicity. The second uh, important further step is the, is the use of these EVs as biomarkers. In the lab, we have this mouse that is a mouse that expresses GR50 upon CRE treatment. And uh, uh, in the CRE positive, GR positive mouse, mice, I was able to isolate, to, to identify by Cytoflex a population that was uh, GFP positive. This population was not recalled in the GFP and in the non-transgenic, meaning that the presence of the DPR is actually driving the, enclo the enclosure of the protein into the EVs. So with this, I want to acknowledge the laboratory that I'm working in, that is the Trotti Lab, and uh, the other two labs that are present in the center at Jefferson, that are the Pasinelli Lab and the Heusler Lab, and also the Rostami Lab, in particular Giacomo Casella, that helped me and allowed me to use the Cytoflex for the analysis of my EVs. And all of you for your attention. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Maria Elena, for that very interesting presentation. So what I forgot to talk, mention before we started this off is that, of course, you can go, please go ahead and submit questions through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And Maria Elena will get to answer as many of those as we can get through. So I was going to start asking you, since ALS is not really my within my field of knowledge, um, how are most of the cases are sporadic? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Up to uh, like percent of the cases are sporadic. Yes. Okay. But between the sporadic cases, a uh, uh, big majority is uh, C9 caused. So it's linked to the C9 mutation. Okay. Also the sporadic cases. Okay. Yes. Uh, and then just also another more general question. What's the treatments that are available? for ALS patients? So now the only treatment is an anti-inflammatory treatment and uh, it, it's not actually reverting or um, preventing uh, the spreading of the disease. So it's, um, yes, it, that, that is the only treatment that is available right now. Okay, thank you. Got a first question from one of our audience members here, from Paolo, who's wondering, in what ways do you think the DPR length might, might affect the propagation efficiency? So I'm not sure if the length is uh, uh, actually affecting the propagation. I, I wanted to assess if the length actually causing an increase in toxicity in the recipient cells. So uh, depending on the run translation, uh, run translation can produce different lengths of DPRs. So uh, to characterize whether uh, the, the, the spreading of also of the longer DPRs was actually causing more toxicity to the recipient cells, uh, that was the question that we wanted to answer. Whether they were enclosing to the EVs and whether uh, their reception would cause toxicity. Uh, so, do you think it's a it's a gain of function toxicity that you're seeing, or is it a loss of function? Or no, I think it's a gain of function. I mean, for sure, like uh, the production of these DPRs are totally a gain of function, and also they're spreading. Yeah. Metap is wondering what is the cargo in these EVs that cause neurotoxicity. So in my paradigm, the cargo are the DPRs uh, themselves. So the DPRs are enclosed into the EVs uh, and when they are received, they cause uh, toxicity. We know that actually in a lot of neurodegenerative disease, there are uh, like uh, also misregulation of the miRNA that are actually enclosed into the EVs. So this is uh, something that people are looking into. So also mRNA cargo can actually modulate uh, the fate of the recipient cell. Okay. And an anonymous attendee is wondering if you checked for TDP43 pathology at later time points and wondering if yes, maybe 24 hours too early. Yes, yes, exactly. That's, that's exactly the point. Like, uh, I, that, that's an ongoing study. So what I, the further step are, of course, to study TDP means localization and aggregation at uh, 48 hours, 72 hours. Also uh, looking at where the drop in viability is most evident. Okay. So there's a lot coming up still. Okay. Uh, Christopher Webster is wondering, do you see any differences in the subcellular localization of your 50 time P DPRs? Does this affect their inclusion into EVs? So uh, the, um, the GR localization into the, let's say, um, into the NSCs that are the spreader, yes, it's different. So GR50 and GR100 are actually localized into the nucleus a lot, uh, but also there is some protein that is still in the cytoplasm. And of course, the localization changes the uh, inclusion of this uh, protein into the EVs. But we have to think that these proteins are anyway produced in the cytoplasm. So probably what's happening is that actually these proteins, uh, some of them, the one that is remaining in the cytoplasm or is just produced can be enclosed into the EVs and then uh, spread and then uh, release outside the cells. Okay, so kind of tagging along in the spread uh, conversation we're having here. Michael Henderson is wondering if there's any evidence uh, that DPR spread in human disease. No, uh, yes, yes, yes. So DPRs, the, the spreading of the DPRs 
is, uh, uh, is studied. So we don't know if it happens through the EVs, that is something that I'm interested in. So also maybe studying human samples and assessing if humans, these DPRs are actually um, seen into the EVs. This is something that I want to pursue. Um, the spreading is uh, assessed. So there is, uh, um, there is usually some cells that are uh, the first focus of the disease. And then there's a gradient spreading of the disease about the central nervous system and uh, this pattern is kind of resembled by DPRs uh, spreading. So this is, it's still ongoing. It's not uh, very well assessed, but that is what has been described so far. Okay, because it had a second part of that question was if the DPR localization correlates with the regions where you see the degeneration. Yeah, I mean, this, this I'm, I'm not actually doing right now pathological studies, uh, but the, this has been correlated, that the DPR present was actually uh, linked to the degeneration in that area. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Kurt, who's wondering if, would any overexpressed protein end up in the EVs like flag GFP? So yes, there is uh, this, uh, uh, also GFP goes into the EVs, but I think that in my paradigm is especially due to the, pre to, to the overexpression. Because in the data that I presented uh, in the last slide with the mouse, um, actually when uh, there is a physiological expression of the protein, GFP doesn't go into the EVs. So probably, uh, the GFP that I see in the EVs when I overexpress is like uh, um, an effect due to the abundance of the protein, while uh, uh, actually the presence of the DPRs actually drives this protein into the EVs. Okay. Uh, Aparna is wondering, are there other cargo also in the EVs that you isolated? Other proteins, mRNA, mRNAs, mRNAs? Sure, sure. It's uh, definitely there are others protein uh, which I haven't investigated. Uh, so I haven't investigated actually the, the, the content, for example, in miRNA, also because these are NSCs, so these are a tumor cell, these are a tumor like cell line. So the content of miRNA would not be reflective of um, anything physiological. Uh, so this kind of study, I think that are worth doing uh, in a more physiological uh, and uh, reliable system, like for example, mice or like from sample from humans. Yeah. And Sandra is wondering uh, if you have any ideas about the reasons why P100 ves vesicles are more toxic, or at least it seems they seem to be. So I think that it depends, uh, first of all, on how uh, they are received into the cells, how they are internalized, and probably which pathway they affect. So it's known that, for example, uh, small EVs are directly loaded into the vesicular trafficking inside the cells. So that can affect uh, some of the pathways inside the cells much more than the larger EVs that maybe are also less internalized than the others. This is something that I haven't looked into. I should. You're getting a lot of great ideas for what to continue yes. on with. <laughs> we have also a question from Rebecca, who's wondering, have you considered looking at these measures in different diseased brain regions, affected versus non-affected, to see if a clearance mechanism might be affecting the EV effect? So that's, that's an interesting question, but I haven't looked into it. So for, for now, all my work has been done in in vitro systems. So for sure, when I will go in vivo, that's going to be part of my study, even though it's challenging because, uh, for example, the mouse model that we have now for C9 are not actually uh, causing any disease into the mouse. So this is challenging because uh, uh, if we don't have a model that is actually toxic, it's difficult to address this question. Definitely. Well, we'll have to check in with you later and see what's going to happen in the future. Uh, thank you so much, Elena, uh, so Maria Elena, for the presentation and answering all these questions. Thank and you. We're not going to move. Thank you. We're now going to move on to our second speaker, which is Sonia George. She's a research scientist at the Van Andel Institute, and she's going to talk about T 
T cells and how they may influence alpha-synuclein aggregates in mouse models of Parkinson's disease. Please go ahead, Sonia. Okay, thank you. I will share my screen. This should work. Okay, hopefully you can hear and see me. Um, so thanks to Mickey and Lisa for the invitation and and, uh, and today I will be presenting some work that we're starting on, looking at the influence of T cells in a mouse model of PD. So for today's presentation, I'll be going through some scientific background to hopefully cement in your mind the role of synuclein and uh, the immune system in Parkinson's disease. I'll touch on the model that we chose to uh, pursue our question and go through some of the outcomes we've got some uh, so far and, and summarized. So I've stolen this figure from uh, Mickey's review where it highlights how complicated Parkinson's disease. There are many factors that seem to be playing a role in this disease over a really long time. And I want to highlight neuroinflammation, synuclein propagation and peripheral inflammation. Um, so <clears throat> basically uh, these factors, I think, oh, I don't know why this is uh, not going forward. Uh, I can't seem to uh, move my slides. Maybe we can have Helen in the background close down your presentation and we can start opening it again and see if that sure. works. Helen, sure. can you please shut that? Thank you. So now you can share it again, Sonia, we'll try it. Um, okay, let me share my screen again. Okay, so these three important um, factors, we believe play a role in, in Parkinson's disease and, um, and the models that uh, I'll present, the model that I present, are hopefully, hopefully gonna enlighten uh, the role of these factors in the disease. What's also important to bring up, and I'm sure everyone's aware, is that the stereotypical pattern of um, pathology that appears in the Parkinsonian case, it starts off in areas that are um, in the olfactory bulb or the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagal nerve. And as the disease progresses, the pathology appears through the brain stem to the mid midbrain and then it litters the whole neocortex. So that's another characteristic that we want to mimic in our, in our model. What's also important is that um, not only are synuclein um, aggregates and pathology found throughout the body, it's also, there are also immune disturbances. So here I'd like to highlight the brain and the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, but also the vagal nerve that's drawn in blue that directly connects the gut to the brain and also the blood in circulation. These are all uh, areas that are affected in Parkinson's disease. So to quickly highlight these, there are uh, genetic risk factors for synuclein from the HLA gene, which is the human leukocyte antigen gene that, in, that implicate the immune system. Anti-inflammatory treatments are risk modulators. There's pro-inflammatory cytokines found in the cerebral spinal fluid. There's um, aggregates found in the vagal nerve, in the colon, in the appendix. And importantly, in the blood, uh, peripheral blood samples have shown uh, alpha-synuclein reactive CD4 T cells. These are T cells that recognize spe specific peptides of alpha-synuclein. There are alterations in immune cell um, uh, uh, populations and there are signs of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And when we look uh, post-mortem, uh, PD cases, there are signs of microgliosis, so activated microglia, also by PET scanning, but also to highlight the role of T cells, there are infiltrating T cells 
found in the in Parkinsonian cases. So uh, there are models uh, out there, and I've selected a few key papers that highlight that whether synuclein is overexpressed using viral vectors or um, the recombinant form of alpha-synuclein is injected in discrete locations. It can cause an immune response, it can cause microglial activation, but importantly, T cells have been found to infiltrate uh, the brain of these animal models. So for us, the role of immune cells in alpha-synuclein, uh, there's a key link there. The synuclein pathology plays a role in the disease, both in genetic and sporadic forms. The inclu synuclein inclusions have been found in multiple locations over the body, and there's evidence for immune activation um, in PD. So immune cells may be this critical link between synuclein aggregation and neurodegeneration. So it led us to ask this question, do T cells influence uh, synuclein aggregation in the mouse model of PD? And we took a fairly um, simple uh, approach, to be honest, to ask this question. So like I mentioned, the Bark staging of PD, where there's a stereotypical um, formation of pathology through interconnected brain regions. We want to try and mimic that. So we went for the human alpha-synuclein preformed fibrillar model, where these fibrils were directly injected stereotactically into the dorsal striatum of a mouse. And uh, so location one is where the inject is the injection site. And we looked at the cell bodies that reside in the substantia nigra at location two. And we looked at another interconnecting brain regions from the striatum, which is the uh, frontal cortex of the mouse. And to ask the role of T cells um, and the adaptive immune system, we went for the NSG mice. These are not skin, skid gamma mice that um, lack the key components of the, of the adaptive immune system. So they lack T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. And we injected the PFFs into this model and we looked for um, pathology four weeks post PFF injection. And I've highlighted for quick reference, the two key groups that I'd like you to focus on. We looked at the uh, inclusion formation by using uh, an antibody directed to phosphorylated alpha-synuclein. So that's our readout for patho uh, pathological alpha-synuclein. In the striatum, substantia nigra and frontal cortex in a wild type C57 black six mouse, which is commonly used in our, in our laboratory and other laboratories, after four weeks, uh, following the human PFF injection, you can see the odd uh, cell in the substantia nigra that's positive for phosphorylated synuclein. Whereas these NSG mice, immunocompromised mice injected with the human PFFs, you can see the striatum, substantia nigra and cortex is littered full of um, uh, pathology. We also compared in this initial study to the NOD mice. So these are non-obese diabetes model that have uh, deficits in the innate immune system, so macrophage deficiencies, they lack natural killer cells. They also, with immune deficiencies, have this increase in pathology. So we uh, um, analyzed this looking at the levels of phosphorylated synuclein by densitometry. And throughout the presentation, all graphs will look like this. They'll have a fold change where we normalize to the wild type PFFs at one, and you can see this significant increase in pathology in the striatum, in the substantia nigra, um, it, and, and in the frontal cortex. So uh, the next step for us then was to um, adoptively transfer T cells into these immunocompromised mice and see what happens. So we did human PFF injections as before. We did a transfer of um, T cells that we took from a wild type 
spleen and we did the adoptive transfer in week five because we knew what the pathology looks like in NHG mice in week four. And then we waited 12 weeks post injection and we could see what the uh, levels of phosphorylated synuclein look like in those brain regions. First, we had to confirm that we actually do have T cells in these immunocompromised mice. So using facts, we compare um, a few groups, but just for demonstration, I've got the NSG mice that lack the T and B cells in the spleen and in the blood, and you can see their presence in the, in the mice that received the T cells. And then by immunohistochemistry, using CD3 as a marker for all T cells, we could see them in the striatum, in the substantia nigra, in the front cortex, and specifically a subset of T cells that we're interested in, CD4. By immunofluorescence, we can see these cells in all three brain regions. So when we look and, and, uh, for phosphorylated alpha-synuclein in the three brain re regions of interest, uh, looking at the saline injection, we don't see any pathology. This is what that wild type C57 background looks like after 12 weeks of a PFF injection. Interestingly, the NSG mice again have this increase that we saw before, but when we injected, when we did the transfer of T cells, we saw a significant reduction in the substantia nigra of this pathology, which was a surprise. So this is graphed again here, full change of phosphorylated alpha-synuclein. And you can see in all three brain regions, it's a similar trend where the NSGPF mice had the increase in pathology and the mice that received the T cell have a decrease. This, this um, reached statistical significance in the substantia nigra. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, microglia activation is present in the Parkinsonian case. So we wanted to look at microglia in our system also because T cells can um, modulate them and can activate them and mobilize them and allow them to be phagocytic. They can also present cells to, um, uh, uh, they can present antigens to T cells. So we have stain for microglia and we have a MATLAB script where it delineates the microglia and we can get a readout for their activation when we um, look at the area versus perimeter index. So an activated mi microglia cell will have a larger area and, uh, a, a, and a smaller perimeter, so that will increase the index. So we stained for IBA1 in the three brain regions, comparing our groups. And you can see um, in general, these NSG mice look like they have an intense staining for IBA1. And when we uh, quantified what it looks like in all three brain regions for the area versus perimeter in the striatum, nigra and frontal cortex, particularly in the striatum, we could see that there was a, a higher index in the mice that received the T cells versus those NSG uh, PFF injected animals. So um, with that, I'd like to summarize that NSG and immunocompromised mice had a, a several fold increase in phosphorylated synuclein in the striatum, nigra and frontal cortex. Um, and when a group of these animals were reconstituted with T cells, uh, we could see a decreased accumulation of alpha synuclein, specifically in the substantia nigra. And we could see persistent microgliosis or the, the intense but one staining in the striatum of NSG T mice compared to the non-transplanted mice. So this is work ongoing and this is our working hypothesis that in the blue scenario where it's the immunocompromised mice that have been injected with the PFFs activates microglia. There's, there's literature out there to suggest that. So the microglia become activated, they can present antigens uh, on, their, on their major histocompatibility complex. Um, and in this scenario, there's no one to present the, the antigen to. So there's the opportunity for synuclein to then be taken up by neurons. But in the scenario where T cells are present, these microglia have the opportunity to present to T cells. And so there's a limited uptake in, in the neurons. 
So um, with that, there's many people I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, there's mem many members of the, of the lab that were involved and in our institute. And uh, I also like to take the opportunity, we're not an immunology lab, so if there's anyone listening with that uh, expertise and you'd like to get involved in projects, you can email me or you can contact me through Twitter. And with that, I'd like to uh, conclude. Thank you so much, Sonia, for that presentation. Uh, so let's kick off the Q&A. And I just thought I was going to start by asking you, you see this decreased alpha-synuclein pathology in the Nigra when the mice have received a T cell transfer. Uh, could that be due to neurodegeneration? Have you done any counts of the nigral neurons? Um, I, uh, yes, I did some stereology on the, uh, on the nigral tissue from those animals. And we saw that the PFF injection itself did cause uh, neurodegeneration, but there was no difference between the groups. So it didn't look like the mice that received the transfer of T cells, they didn't look like they had any further neurodegeneration than the, the other groups. Okay. So we have one question here from an anonymous attendee. Did you test the systemic administration of PFFs to your immunocompromised mice, for example, in the feed, nasal swab, or peritoneal injections? No. So is the question asking whether we see synuclein um, peripherally or should we administer synuclein peripherally? I think administration of uh, oh, okay. No, we haven't. That's actually a good, a good idea. We haven't tried that. I know that um, that's been done and when it is administered peripherally, there is recruitment of activated monocytes into the brain that play a role. So I think that is a good, good point. And we have a question from Charlotte and she ask, she's asking, do you think that the T cells are directly affecting alpha-synuclein pathology or are they helping support cells through alternative pathways? Uh, it's possible that there are, they're supporting and there's other cell types involved, I think. Um, so we've been a little uh, narrow-minded in ignoring cell types such as astrocytes. Uh, they also look like the new papers coming out that they remain uh, antigen presenting cell in the brain. So I think they uh, likely there are CD4 populations. So they could be T, T helper cells. They could be coordinating the effort, I think. Thank you. So that could be some upcoming studies. Uh, Cecilia says, great talk. Oh, no. great talk. What is your hypothesis uh, why the T cells would specifically target the Nigra? Yeah, this is uh, this is the tricky question. <laughs> we're not we're not sure why it's specific in the Niagara. These cells seem to be uh, vulnerable. There seems to be, in general, microglia populations differ in the Niagara than in other places. So maybe it's that coordinated effort with these microglia cells um, that are there. So, uh, but in all honesty, we don't. We don't know. That's something we need to uh, work on. Thank you. Anke is wondering, with the adaptive transfer, you administrated all type of T cells, or have you thought about doing a select uh, towards a specific cell type? Yeah, so this was our first step, and we didn't really know what to expect. So I did it, it was a pan, um, uh, I isolated pan T cells, but yes, our next steps are actually to start looking at the different subsets of T cells and see if we can, um, uh, if, if those different subsets play a role in differentially uh, uh, altering the pathology. Yeah. Yeah. Michael is wondering, did you stain for T cells in the wild type mice? And is there infiltration of T cells into the brains of these mice? Does it, and also does it relate to re the regions that have pathology? Yeah, I haven't actually <laughs> done that yet, but that's, that's an important point. So a lot of these models have used synuclein and found the infiltration when synuclein has been overexpressed or PFFs. So I need to uh, I need to get on that and, and, and do it. 
Yeah. And an anonymous attendee is saying, great talk. And is wondering how you handle PFF. Is it a prion level laboratory or? Yeah, so we, um, we have many regulations to uh, um, when we work with the PFFs. So we, uh, there's actually a paper, I guess we can share on the face, Facebook page that uh, goes into great detail on how to decontaminate after you've uh, 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 used PFFs in the lab. So we use SDS to um, clean down anything that's come in contact with the PFFs in terms of needles and equipment and all that. So uh, we take great precaution when we, when we use it. So, um, but I think if we share that paper, maybe that will answer all those, all those questions. Yeah, so everybody can join our 3P discussions group on Facebook and get more information. Uh, but do, have you ever heard about any evidence of PFF uh, transmission into humans? No, I don't think that's documented. I guess you have to check in 20 years later and, <laughs> and see. <laughs> um, but it's not documented at the moment. Okay. <laughs> We might be the test groups for it. Right. <laughs> uh, Melissa, Melissa is wondering, are you able to inject T cells at the same time as PFF? And if so, would you expect a, a prevention of PFF uptake if you did that? Yeah, so that's, um, that's a great question because that's some of the things we're thinking of doing next. We, so to, I guess, to recreate the human scenario, that's probably a better approach to see if the PFFs are there at the same time as uh, um, the T cells uh, would mimic a human condition better. And I think we can, we can try that. There's many picking the time points and knowing when to do the transfer and PFF injections. They're, they're hard to know until we, we, we give them a shot. So um, there, there's definitely a lot of to do's <laughs> following this work. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca is wondering, uh, opposite to the results you have seen in using immunocompromised mice, do you know if there are an opposite alpha synuclein effect if you would use uh, mice with a hyperactivated immune system? Do you, would you see reduced alpha synuclein aggregates in those? Yeah, so um, I guess the closest thing we have is um, uh, models that use LPS where there's a pro-inflammatory stimuli, we know that those activate microglia, for instance. And I guess these, uh, these models, I mean, there's conflicting results out there, but some models show that when there's LPS, these microglia get hyperactive, um, but then their ability to phagocytose is not necessarily better. But in terms of T cells, if they're hyperactive, um, I'm not sure whether uh, it's a dysregulated system and then other things kind of happen. Yeah. You know, things don't function the way they should. But, yeah. Uh, definitely something to think about. Mm -hmm. it's a question. And Cecilia is wondering if you know if uh, there's a specific epitope in alpha synuclein that is targeted by T cells in the mouse? Ah, in the mouse? I don't know. I know that the um, Sir David Sultz's work, uh, important work that's come out, another their follow-up paper recently. They first described that Y thirty nine, and the and the phosphorylated synuclein site, the the uh, serine one through nine. They're the they're the locations for the human, but I'm not sure if anyone's looked at it in the mouse yet. But it's curious that it's those two locations. The Y39 is near where a lot of the mutations are in the human PD and, and the phosphorylation site has to be phosphorylated by the looks of things. So that, I think that is very curious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and anonymous attendee is wondering if you expose the animal that you take the T cells from to alpha synuclein prior to isolation? Yeah, so uh, I think that's a great question. We would like to get uh, T cells that are specifically recognizing, recognizing synuclein. I think that is a good point and we hope to do that next actually. 
and see if that uh, alters the the pathology. Yeah, for sure. So what do would you hypothesize would happen if you used those? I think uh, I think we would see a a more efficient decrease in in pathology. That's my my yeah. hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, Kurt is wondering if there's any evidence for lower CD for positive T cell counts in PD patients? Yeah, so it looks like there are. Um, I think from memory overall CD4 is down, but there's a select population. There's a, a CD4 population that's activated, that's increased in PD. It's a bit of a confusing result, but I think, um, I know CD8 positive stays the same. CD4 looks down, but there's a overall, but there's a certain population of CD4 positive cells that are activated and increased in PD. Okay. Thank you. Juan is saying, great talk, Sonia. Have you assessed the presence of injected PFF outside the brain in the appendix in your, for example, in your compromised mice? No, but that's a good point. Uh, no, we've only looked at the brain and uh, I also wanted to uh, look at Sanuthian by fax as well, but we haven't uh, we haven't done that yet. But that's a that's a good idea. Yeah. And I write these down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good that we're recording this. It's good yes. you can just rewatch it. <laughs> Uh, we get a more practical question here uh, from an anonymous attendee wondering how did you quantify the phosphocerium pathology uh, in the nigra? Are you sure in which cells it is? Yeah, so at the moment we didn't do any double staining, so this is just phosphorylated stenutlin, so in terms of cell type I can't reveal anything. But uh, we used densitometry. It was, there were images taken at regular intervals, multiple images per animal, and I used image J to, uh, to analyze it. Yeah. And I think we'll round this off with a last question. We still have some questions that haven't, we haven't had the time to go through and we'll post them at the 3P discussions page. But Sandra is wondering, do you know what the percentage of peripherally injected T cells that reaches or infiltrates the brain? Uh, no, I don't know from, uh, from what I've injected, what actually gets there in terms of absolute numbers. Um, from the staining, it's, it looks like a small percentage <laughs> from what I know I inject, um, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. So, so do you think it's a peripheral effect or is it a local effect just from the cells that infiltrate the brain? that you see that decreases the pathology? Right, I'm gonna say, uh, for me, I think it was a local, whoever can get in uh, um, it, uh, is acting on, on affecting the pathology, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Sonia, and thank you, Maria Elena, for these excellent talks and answering all of these questions. I think we all learned a lot today. So I just wanna, wrap this session up by promoting next week's sessions. On Tuesday the 28th, we will have a special seminar where PD patient advocates Ben Stescher and Hugh Johnston will join us. So please sign up for that. And on next Thursday, we'll have a therapy te themed session where Diptaman, I'm not, uh, Neil, uh, sorry, I'll pronounce your name correctly next week. And myself will be presenting our research on uh, focusing on therapies for synucleonopathies. And with that, I just wish everybody a happy, a nice evening, good, great rest of your day. And thank you all for joining us here. Bye.